I'm going to ask you then to turn with me to the Gospel of John. And we are in the 19th chapter. And uh, we continue our look at this last day of our Lord. He is being tried. There are six stages to his trial, and we are today going to continue on in stage number six. He is once again before the Roman governor, Pilate. And what happened in the passage we studied last was that they flogged our king. They bent our Lord over a small stump, they tied him down, and they scourged him. And I don't like thinking about it. But the scriptures said it was going to happen. A portion of that we read just a moment ago, and that same portion we have just sung. A man of sorrows. We studied last week what I, we just sang. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned. Why would he do such a thing? Bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. And worse, they flogged our king. Humanity is so depraved, so wicked in its desire to promote self. We also came to understand last week that Satan had his day. That too was prophesied, that Satan would bruise his heel, and he's doing it here on this day. Another interesting aspect to all of that, and sometimes I know that you encountered trials, difficulties, confusions that you don't understand, and that go on for a day, and a month, and a year, and decades more. You pray, you desire healing, you desire forgiveness from someone. You just, you're just wrestling through the issues of life, and it doesn't come on your timetable. May I remind you that God did not rescue his son either. God in heaven watched his son go through this day and this ordeal, silent as he stood accused. The father did not rescue his son. As we look at this passage, it's a couple, a couple things have been identified here as to what Jesus is doing. And I want to remind you that the overarching thing that he's doing, the most important thing that he is managing is that he is orchestrating his death by crucifixion. He is totally in control here. He is going to self-fulfill fulfill the prophecies that he spoke as the word himself. Centuries earlier, he is going to self-fulfill them as only he can. In this day, because of that, he has given intermittent answers. Sometimes he'll talk, other times he just stands silent. Silent as he stood accused, just standing there. Dead silence, which is shocking, consider the circumstances. He's not seeking revenge. He is not desiring vengeance. He understands the command, the will of God, where God has said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So Jesus is not taking vengeance. Peter, that first pastor of the Jerusalem Community Church, wrote a letter decades later recalling some of this. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure like the Lord. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. That was written 2,000 years ago, still true. Still being followed obediently. 
by those who desire to follow the example of Christ. And the world doesn't understand. And the people on this day, when they're looking at Jesus, I'm sure many of them are, this is the weirdest thing. And they might do it to you as well as you follow the example of Christ. But again, this is amazing. But why is he doing it? Because he believes in something. He believes in the Father's plan, and he is going to carry it out. And so that's what brings us to our passage today. I'm going to start reading, just to get us going here, a little bit of review, just starting at chapter 19 and verse 1. We looked at this last week, but it says, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Remember, Pilate wasn't wielding that whip. He had the others do it. He had his soldiers do it. But Pilate is attributed to it. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Our passage today begins, Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And there it is again. Our first phrase to consider today is as Pilate has brought Jesus out, wearing the crown, wearing the robe, bloodied and beaten. He brings him out and presents him to the accusers, the Jewish high priests, the Jewish enemies of Jesus. He says, I find, here he is, and I find no guilt in him. For him to say that is uh, just, again, bearing true to what Scripture has always taught. This Lamb of God, in chapter 1, as stated, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, has now come to the end of his, end to his last day. And another individual has inspected this Lamb, has considered him significantly, and has concluded... I find no guilt in him. He is without blemish. He is a lamb without blemish, spot, as was required by the Mosaic law. And here is a pagan attesting to the fact. Let me just show you. This is one of seven times in the scriptures about this account of Jesus where he is identified as, I find no guilt in him. Said in various ways, but the fact still remains. Quickly, let me show you these verses. Matthew 27 and verse 4, saying, I, Judas is talking now, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. <laughs> they said, what is that to us? See to yourself. I mean, that's not our problem anymore. Innocent blood. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Nothing deserving death. Herod has said that. We, st we looked last week at this verse. Pilate's wife, besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. And now here in John chapter 19, and verse 4, Pilate has again said it. Later in this day, the thief on the cross from Luke 23 will say, and we indeed justly, meaning we're being punished, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. The thief on the cross saying that. Later, a few moments later possibly, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this, was a, this man was innocent. That's a pagan man, a centurion, not a Jew, not yet a follower of Christ. Will he become a follower of Christ? I think so. I don't know, but certainly this man was innocent. His heart has gone out to a prisoner. A Roman centurion has been awed by our Lord on the cross. A couple verses later, when the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. These are <laughs> remarkable statements being offered in testimony to who Jesus is. He's innocent. I find no guilt in him. Verse 5 continues, So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, 
Behold the man. What did he not say right there? Behold your king. Hail, king of the Jews. Later on, he's going to identify him as such. Right here, he says, behold the man. Here's this guy. Just a man. He's weak. I find him ordinary. I find him pathetic. Behold the man. Here he is. Look what we've done to him. What he's doing here, remember, he's trying to get out of having to put this man to death. I find no guilt in him. And so he has had him scourged, hoping that this would appease the Jews' fury. This would be a sufficient ice cube into the boiling pot that will just settle it all down, just simmer it, just cause it to settle down. He's appealing to the Jews' pity. He's appealing to their honor. Certainly this is sufficient, is it not? You wanted your pound of flesh, and I've given it to you. Can we be done with this? He has suffered greatly. Clearly, as the story continues, and it must, but Pilate does not understand these Jews. He doesn't understand their motives. He doesn't understand their passion for what's going on here. We've already been introduced a little bit to the Barabbas story. That's, that's going to come back here in, later. But it's like, wow, Pilate has misjudged. Again, he just doesn't get it. These Jews have tasted blood like an animal who has tasted blood. Ah, they want more. We've tasted it. We're getting there. We want more. This will not appease us. They are far past pity. Pity? <laughs> no, we're not appeased. You did what you did. We're happy for that too, but we want this man's death. And that's why they respond. Verse 6, read with me. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, cried out. Remember, we used the word last week. They've gone ballistic. They are beyond settling down. They cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Can you picture Pilate right there at that moment, thinking what's going to happen? I don't know how long it has been since he sent Jesus to be scourged, to be mocked and scorned. He's now come back into the judgment place was that an hour was it 30 minutes was it 20 minutes how long did all that take and Pilate's thinking to himself this will do it this will do it behold the man crucify him screamed at him Pilate is <laughs> bewildered he's probably saying though we would use these words I don't know what their words at the time was these folks are nuts They've lost their heads. What is the matter with these people? These Jews of Palestine that I am the governor of. Hey, he doesn't understand them. He, he's freaking out about this. He has failed. His goal to settle it all down has failed. They are yelling at him, crucify him. Apparently, death alone will solve the problem. And what these Jews are asking Pilate to do, since Pilate has found no guilt in him, they're asking him to commit judicial um, a suicide, a homicide. Murder him for us. From, from your bench of judgment, murder him for us. Because he's, he's innocent. So murder him for us. That's what we want. Give it to us. Pilate, his first take on this, his next response is, is, is interesting. He says to them here in the verse, Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. For I find no guilt in him. He says it again. Take him yourselves. Go ahead, you crucify him. This is a weird phrase for him to say because he knows, well, it's almost as if he says, I dare you. I dare you. He's putting himself in a position over them. They want Jesus crucified, and he's saying to them, only if I say so. Take him yourself and crucify him. And he knows that they can't do that. They don't have the means to crucify. They don't have the authority to crucify He's just saying, he's mocking them. He's taunting them. He's getting back at them for making him look weak. And he does look weak because he hasn't solved the problem yet. So he's trying to show them their weakness. He's mocking them by saying, I'm of Rome. You're not. We are the conquerors. You are the submissive ones. And he's mocking them by saying these words. They're powerless. 
And again, he's reminding them, you have brought no charges of guilt. I find no guilt in him. I'm not going to do this for you. I'm not going to commit judicial murder. The Jews totally understood what he just said there. They're processing perfectly with him. And he know, they know that he's being sarcastic. He's taunting them. He's putting them in their place, but they're still not going to give up. And here we see in the passage a turn, a change from what once was the, where they were trying to go to say, okay, we're going to take it back on ourselves then. You've kind of served it into our court by saying, you take them. And so they are now going to bring up a religious issue one more time. They were trying to present him civilly before Pilate as an insurrectionist, as one who was opposed to Caesar, and this and that, and that didn't work. See, Pilate said, I find no guilt in him. So they have clearly read Pilate's challenge here. He's been sarcastic, but they're going to take it. They're going to try this religious issue. And it says there in verse 7, the Jews answered him, well, we have a law. We have a law. They're bringing it back to them. We have a law. It's not Roman law. We have one. This is a reference to the Mosaic law. And it, what they are going to refer to here is a law that is found in Leviticus chapter 24. From Leviticus, the book of the law, right? Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. That's the law that they're thinking of. We have a law. They know it. I don't think Pilate knows it, but they simply said, we have a law, and they go on and says, that, and according to that law, he ought to die. Why? Because he has made himself the son of God. He's made himself the son of God. That's blasphemy to us. We can't tolerate that. We're not going to allow for this. Okay? So Pilate is now considering. You see, we talked about it last week as far as the, the, the challenge that he has had with these Jewish people, that there have been, in a sense, two strikes against him. And this whole scenario is playing out as a third strike, as another time where he was not able to read the people well and keep a riot, keep an uprising from happening. Now, he quelled them. He pushed those other two situations down. But is this a third one? Obviously, that's what he's trying to do, trying to solve the problem. And here comes strike three. Are they going to riot? Why not just kill one person, a nobody, and bring peace? That is the challenge in front of him. So if he considers this charge from their law, the, the whole dynamic is brought up again. Then possible guilt could be presented. He has so far found no guilt in Roman law. So here it comes. Now notice, just as an aside here, what did the law require if someone was guilty of this crime? What's the punishment? Stoning. Doesn't say crucifixion there. So again, do you realize how hard it is for a Jewish man to be convicted under Mosaic law, yet be crucified instead of stoned? This is difficult to do. And it's going to happen. But again, Jesus is orchestrating. Okay? So let's read verse 8. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now, we haven't really been, been introduced to Pilate's fear yet, but now, by the authority of the Scriptures, we come to realize he has been somewhat afraid. He's been presenting other emotions, other ideas in his head, this and that. He's even been sarcastic. He's been very bold. He's been very controlling. But here we have an inkling into the fact that he has been fearful for a period of time. And now, because of what they are presenting to him, he's more fearful. Well, how, what is this? Well, clearly, as we've talked about, he's playing politics, and his future, he's now seeing, is in peril. He knows about, it's not the three-strike law, remember, no baseball then, but they are, he is aware that whatever he says and how he manages his governorship, the words get back to Caesar Augustus. It gets back to the empire. And so he is concerned about what this might mean. Now, the question can be asked, how is it that he's even more afraid because of that statement that the Jews said? The Jews said, we have a law. Is, what is it that, that adds to the fear that Pilate has already had? Is it the Jews 
or is it Jesus? Is he now processing his, the Jews are causing me more fear or Jesus is causing me more fear? I'm of the opinion that it's Jesus. And let me explain why. Jesus' kingdom words have already been stated to him. In chapter 18, Jesus has said to him, my kingdom is not of this world. Now that's a veiled communication of divinity. It's not of this world implying something else, implying another location. He has said that to him in John 18. And also in John 19, he has been scourged. And what is Jesus' response to being scourged? I'm going to use a word, <laughs> calm. I'm not saying he's not in pain. He's in agony. Yet his response to it all, to the, to the fact that repeatedly, I find no guilt, I find no guilt, I find no guilt, yet this punishment is still occurring. What is the response? He's not screaming out for his rights. He's not screaming out that he's being abused and mistreated and it's unlawful. He's not doing any of that. He's silent. His calm response to, to the scourging. Another thing that I think is now weighing and causing some fear to Pilate is he's remembering his wife's note. His wife had said to him, have nothing to do with this righteous man. You add these things together, and then the Jews say to him, we have a law, and they say he is claimed to be the son of God. Pilate is now processing his worldview into what they just said, and he is growing fearful. Because now, son of God has been added into the mix. This would be something that a pagan, and he's Roman, and they have their religious system, okay? There are the gods of Rome, and the gods have sons. This is not, you know, unknown to him. He is now thinking, do the Jews have a god that has a son? And is this man before me in human form that a son of God? a pagan, a god of some sort that has sent his son, and I had him scourged? I scourged a divinity? I scourged a divine being? Oh, no. What have I done? What, what if it's true that this guy in some way, somehow, based on my kingdom is not of this world, the way he handled the scourging, my wife said something, and now, he, son of God, really? I think his heart began to race as he considers these ideas, have I incurred the wrath of the gods? Now remember, he's a pagan. He has his thinking, and this is part of that. So now, Pilate is going to act in some fear that has been identified here. And what does he do? He retreats inside. Let's read the next verse, verse 9. He entered his headquarters again, and said to Jesus, so he, obviously, Jesus comes with him. He get, leaves, quote, the people. He enters back into his private area. And he's going to have another Q&A time with Jesus. He's fearful. What have I done? Who is this guy? All right? And notice the question he asks in verse 9. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Where? He didn't ask him who, remember? He already asked him that in, the, in chapter 18. He didn't ask him, what, he doesn't mean here, what city are you from? Oh, Nazareth. Okay, thanks, good, I was just checking. No, Galilee, okay, fine, whatever. No, that's not what his point is. He's fearful. What have I done? And he's asking this question. Basically, he is saying, are you of divine origin? Is that who you are? Are you a son of the gods? Are you more than just a man? <laughs> Second part of the verse, but Jesus gave him no answer. <laughs> How's that doing for Pilate's well-being right here, right now? No answer. Just standing there. Where are you from? No answer. Jesus just looking at him. Pilate's heartbeat his blood pressure, his predicament. He's, he's fearful. He's scared right here. And again, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. I read some of Isaiah 53 a, a while ago. Here's Isaiah 53 in verse 7. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That prophecy is happening right here. Who are you? Where are you from? Silence. Not an answer. He opened not his mouth. And why? Well, because he already gave that answer. You already asked me this. I answered that question. Chapter 18 and verse 36. 18 and verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. It's like, I answered where I'm from. Not from this world. So I don't, I'm not answering you again. You, you kind of <laughs> laughed at my answer a while ago. What is truth? Sarcastically said, Psh, what is truth? You rebuffed my answer. I'm not answering it now. And what we have happening here is that God has stopped talking to Pilate. Jesus, as God, has stopped talking to Pilate. scary thought have you ever considered it to you that Pilate as Pilate has experienced that God might stop talking to you has God ever spoken to you you heard it through his word you understand you you get it but you're just mm, not going to do that may I say relative to the most important issue of life today is the day of salvation today is the day of salvation. What a glorious thought. Isaiah 49 and verse 8 has this reference. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. This is who our God is, prophesied to be a God of salvation in your day of trouble. You have found favor with me. I want to show you another verse. That is quoted later in 2 Corinthians. That, that is known by the Apostle Paul, that phrase, that teaching, and he incorporates it into his letter to the Corinthians. In chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Isaiah 49, 6. Now, Paul says, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Are you saved? Do you know the Savior? Do you know the work of the Lord Jesus Christ? To go through all that we've been studying for your sin. If you do, praise God. Rejoice. Sing. May that change your life day by day. If you don't, may I again say, today is the day of salvation. Choose him. Because it's possible that God will stop talking to you. He stopped talking to Pilate. Pilate knew Pilate is not going to be given the second answer. Reminds me of Exodus chapter 8, a unique story. How in this interaction of Moses with Pharaoh in letting the people go and the plagues and all that's a part of all of that, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart in Exodus chapter 8. You can read the story. What happens in Exodus chapter 9? What's the next significant thing? that we read about in this regard? God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God stopped talking to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh went on with himself. It's really good of us to humble ourselves. When the Lord is talking, to humble ourselves. And I want to ask you to turn with me to a passage in James. I love the letter of James. That's why we studied it. But James chapter 4 and verse 6 has a scary and blessed portions to it. It's just, it puts you back on your heels, but then you come back and say, okay, that's all right then, good, thank you. But it puts you back on your heels because in James chapter 4, 
verse 6, it says, but he gives more grace. And it's like, yes, because I've got a lot of grace. I know a lot of grace of God, and he gives more grace, more. It's like, I need more. Thank you, because I need more. Today and next week and next year, I need more. Keep it coming. Thank you, Lord. He gives more grace. The question is fairly asked, to who? Who gets even more grace? It just keeps coming. Just read it. Therefore, it says, point my, my identifies this as a proverb from chapter 3, but it says, God opposes the proud. What is God like? Who is God? What is he like? What does he do? How does he engage? How does he interact? There's an answer. God opposes the proud. Sometimes we think wrongly by that verse that God is watching the game, the football game, all right? It's football, whatever. He's watching the game, and he's, he's saying, oh, oh okay, oh. no. God's not on the sidelines. God is in the game. And to the proud, he's on the other side of the line of scrimmage. God is opposing the proud. He's not watching. <laughs> he's carrying out his will, and you're not with it. You're going to get run over. It's not going to go the way you desire it to go. He opposes the proud, and God will win. This is not in doubt. Comma, but gives grace to the humble. So James summarizes like, so, next word, so, <laughs> submit yourselves therefore to God. Humble yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is true for Pilate also. This can be true for him. Submit to God. Allow the truth to be true. Cleanse your hands, you sinners which means stop doing your deeds of sin, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, which means stop with the game being played in your mind and in your heart about, ah, well, you know, and your rationalizations. No, stop with the double-mindedness. Purify your heart, purify your hands, purify your heart. Be wretched, Pilate. Mourn, Pilate. Weep, Pilate. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom, Pilate. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice, today is the day to humble yourself. No guarantee that you'll hear the voice again. The fact remains for Pilate that he's not seeking truth. He is not humbling himself. Not, not happening. Or Jesus would have answered Jesus would have answered him again. And another honest, sincere, humbling question, another answer would have been given. And another one, and another one, and another one, because Jesus loves this man. But this man is not in that place. He has hardened his heart. Another aspect to this is that Jesus is, again, orchestrating his crucifixion death. And he cannot say anything now in front, with this inner engagement with Pilate, that's going to get him out of that. That's going to free him. Jesus is not trying to free himself. He's not interested in having a dialogue with someone who's not turning in humility toward him. He is trying to orchestrate his death. And so he just is silent. He cannot say what would free himself. And what is Pilate's response? Well, he was fearful. And he didn't allow that fear to allow him to submit to the possible truth that Jesus actually is the Son of God. His pride is going to overcome his fear. It's going to overwhelm it. How do we know? Verse 10. Let me get there. Verse 10. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? You're not going to talk to me, huh? You're just going to stand there? Deaf, mute, you were talking earlier, you're not going to talk now. What's the matter with you? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know I have power? You can maybe be silent with other people, but you dare not be silent with me. 
Notice his pride, his position is over, is just overwhelming fear. And he's using this power to crush his own fear, his own sensation of, oh no. He's just overcoming that. It's typical. This is the governor from Rome, possibly at one time a military commander. And when the military commander says jump, everybody says how high. And he's used to this. He is identifying himself as Caesar Augustus's representative. I'm the man in this area. Everybody knows it. Speak to me. You're not going to speak to me? To me? He's accustomed in these situations to prisoners or even soldiers or citizens, whomever, to them withering before him, whimpering, cringing in fear. That's what he's used to, and Jesus is standing there, confident and bold in the Father's will. And Pilate is ticked off. He makes quite the statement. I have authority. Verse 10. Do you not know that I have authority? I have the position of power. I have the ability to carry out death or life to you. Don't you know who I am? And you're not going to speak to me? He's basically saying, I can commit judicial murder. I have the power of death and life. If I wanted to kill you right now, I could. Right or wrong, wouldn't matter. I have the power of life and death over you. This is, in a sense, not unheard of that someone in this position would say something like that. Jesus told a parable about such an individual. You can read it in Luke 18, but I'm just going to read the verse. He said, in a, Jesus Jesus he. Jesus said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Has that ever happened in earth, on the earth? That someone in power doesn't fear God and doesn't care about man. I'm it. What are you going to do? I know you can't do anything. I'm it. <laughs> I do what I want. That's what Pilate is saying here. I'm above the law. In fact, I am the law. <laughs> what are you going to do? Talk to me. How dare you stand there silently? I can do whatever I want. And as I read that, the reason that Jesus could use that example in the parable that he's going to talk about is because when he said that, everybody goes, oh, I know such things. I know about that dynamic. Can a babysitter be that? The lowest level of authority that sometimes people are given can a babysitter not fear God and not care about her, her, the kids? I'm going to do what I want to do. Can a babysitter do that? Yeah. Can a parent do that? Teacher? Coach? Boss? Captain in the army? I mean, this is a common thing for those who are with power and know that they, they rule it. It's, it's only unto them. It's a common claim among the ungodly and the powerful, at whatever level that might begin. Doesn't matter. This is common. And Pilate, at a certain level, as the governor from Rome, but same thing, and everybody, everybody knows. So we come to verse 11, and we're going to see here that this is the time for the teacher to teach. He is now going to open his mouth. Verse 11, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. That's a bold statement. Um, it's a claim of Scripture. Is it true? What's your worldview about that statement? Do you agree or disagree? You're given another opportunity to agree with it. Elsewhere in Scripture, Paul, speaking of such things in chapter 13 to the Romans, he made this statement, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. From above, from heaven. And it's true for Pilate. So Jesus says it. Jesus is defending his father's, <clears throat> his father's honor he puts Pilate in his place. 
How bold must you need to be to say this? And if you're in your condition, Jesus' condition, standing before the power of Rome and make this statement as a nobody from nowheresville in Galilee, bloodied, beaten, spat upon, crown of thorns, silly robe, and to say this to this guy. Could Jesus have displayed divine power right here and now and turned him into a frog? I guess. Could Jesus do something that would evidence his power of who he truly is? Who do you think you are not talking to me? Could Jesus have answered that question in a powerful, miraculous kind of way? Sure. But he won't. Why not? Because Pilate... And the accusers, all of these people arrayed against him, are tools in the Father's plan. It's been decided. It is what God has allowed to be true. And so it just continues on. And so basically the answer that Jesus is saying here is that the reason I am the way I am is because I I am bending my will to the obedience to the Father. And so do as you will, do as you must, but just know. You didn't have any power, but it was given you from heaven. He makes a concluding statement here in his response. He says, therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Um, Interesting concept there. First of all, who? Who is the he? There's a couple options. It could be who has delivered Jesus over. Well, he could be Caiaphas. That's who brought Jesus to Pilate. In stage from stage three to stage four of the trial, it was Caiaphas who delivered him over to Pilate. It could maybe be Judas, that that's who is in Jesus' mind, that I was delivered, I was betrayed by Judas. Maybe it's the priests themselves, he, those priests who have done this to me. Could it maybe be, in a sense, is Jesus thinking Satan? And the, the plan of Satan to deliver me over to you. I, who could it be? Um, I'm of the opinion it's Caiaphas is who is being referenced here. It was Caiaphas who brought him to Pilate. That act of Caiaphas, which was deliberate and calculating, in spite of the evidence, because Jesus was innocent in their trials as well. (coughs) This Caiaphas has seen the prophecies. This Caiaphas knows the Old Testament. This is the Messiah. Caiaphas is aware of the miracles Caiaphas is aware of God's word. And in spite of all of that, he said no. And he turned him over. As we come to the conclusion of this passage, the question is clearly, who has the authority? Who has the power? Who has the sovereign position to cause all that is happening? The answer is clear from Scripture. It's a loving God. A loving God. Not a God who is, doesn't like people. Not a God who has somehow lost control, doesn't know what's going on. But a loving God who is abundant in grace, who is desiring to exalt the humble. James 4. He desires to exalt the humble. And he's going to exalt them by humbly They come to him and acknowledge their sin and the work of Christ on the cross, who he is, what he's done, and humble themselves. And God is saying, that's it. That's it. That's what I want. Do that because I want to exalt you into forgiveness, into cleanliness. That's who has the authority. And he is willing to extend himself to all who exercise their free will and choose him. Free will and choose him. Choose him. Come. Today is the day of salvation. If anyone would like to talk with me about that, I'm all for it. On the back of your bulletin is another presentation of the gospel in a little more detail. And I'd be pleased to talk with any of you at any time about these matters or anything else. Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for the account of the Gospel of John. How this has come to us, how you have preserved it for us to know and to learn and to be blessed by. 
I pray these words we have considered today would be uh, thought on, considered. I pray that you would continue to do the great work of drawing people unto yourself, and that you would cause people to humble themselves, that they of their own free will, given the circumstances that is true in their lives, that they would humbly submit to the plan of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'll see you next week.